school that demonstrates and exhibits God. Let me hit this continue button real quick. There we go. People want to be next to the view to see God's presence, to see God's glory. We want to see the mountains, you know, who don't want to live in Colorado or even in Arizona with these huge, gorgeous mountains where you can be in your living room and look out your window and see these gorgeous mountains. Who don't want to be in, in, in uh, Aspen at the top of those mountains where you can see all that gorgeous beauty? Who don't want to be in some of these countries who got uh, oceans and seas that, that are clear blue and different colors? And who don't want to experience that? Like the things that we haven't tainted are still amazing to us. We pay big money to go on safari trips, to experience the wildlife, the nature, to see the animals. Whoa, look at this one. Look what he does. Look how he eats. Look how he walks. We're amazed by God's beauty. Amen. Everything we didn't ruin, we are still amazed about. So... In 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27, it says, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Will God dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. Again, there's not one heaven. There's the heaven, and then there's the heavens of heavens. God created the heavens and the earth. So in this scripture is saying, um, behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, O God. Not even the heavens can contain your glory. He said, how much less this house that I have built. So he's saying not the earth, nor the heaven, nor the heavens of heaven can contain all the glory that you have. This is why, again, he forms and he feels. He places knowledge so that you can experience him because nothing can contain all his glory. So then Jesus comes on the scene. Now, Jesus uh, comes on the scene and John sees him. And John says something that catches my attention. He says, behold the Lamb of God. I'm going to write that up here, actually. Mm -hmm. He said, behold the Lamb of God. Now, John, the Bible says John isn't the light, but he's here to be a testimony to the light. And the first thing he notices when he sees Jesus, oh, I know who that is. That's the Lamb of God. The Bible says the Lamb was slain before the foundations of the earth. That means before the earth ever began. That means before even one word was spoken to form everything he created, this lamb that John just spoke of was already slain. Jesus was slain before the foundations of the earth. Why? Mm -hmm. The scripture says in his forbearance, he knew that man would part from him. He knew of man disobedience. So before I even start this thing called creation, before I even start forming and letting words of declaration go, before I even say, let there be light, this lamb has got to die. So he grabs the lamb and he carries him to the altar and he slaughters the lamb and the lamb leaks out his blood. That lamb is the son of God. That lamb is the image mm -hmm. of God. The image is the anointing. I'll say it again. The image is the anointing. In the spirit, it's the anointing. In the flesh, it's the blood. In the spirit, it's the anointing. In the flesh, it's the blood. So the Lamb of God was slain, and he took that blood as an atonement for our sin, and he used that blood, and now I'm going to show you exactly how he used it the scripture says christ we just said what christ was we said christ is the image christ is the blood so uh christ is the visible image of the invisible god mm -hmm. It's the visible image of the invisible God. 
It's also the wisdom and power of God. It's also the authority. I don't want you to get power and authority confused. Authority means the legal right to command. It means that is your inherited birthright. It means that you have the power to command something into existence. You have the legal right. You have the authority in Christ. Um, power means ability, ability over circumstances, ability to overcome. Again, we talked about knowledge, understanding, wisdom, and then ability. So again, authority is the legal right to command. Power is the ability over circumstances. So he took this thing called Christ, the anointed word. And again, it's the word is the body. The anointing is the, the covering, the spirit of it. And it says Christ is the beginning. Do you know that when something begins, that's when the clock starts? Until it begins, the clock don't start. Until it begins, the clock does not start. So Christ is the beginning. So if Christ is the beginning, the scripture says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In mm -hmm. Christ, God created the heavens and the earth. So he slayed the lamb. And then he took this blood, that anointing that's on the inside of that lamb, and then he used that anointing. He used the beginning. Christ is the beginning. He used the word and the anointing, and he used that to create the heavens and the earth. In Christ, God created the heavens and the earth. In Christ, God created the heavens and the earth. Mm -hmm. So that means the heavens and all of the earth and everything in it came from that blood, from that anointing. That's how it was made. The word was in God because God is knowledge. The anointing is in God because God is spirit. And when God speaks, it said, there's a scripture that said, God declared Jesus. I got to find that for you. I believe it's in the book of John. It says, God, it says, Jesus was in the bosom of God. And God declared Jesus into the earth. He declared him. That means that word was on the inside of him, mixed in with that anointing. He spoke it, and out came Jesus, and the word became flesh, and it dwelt among men. He declared Jesus. So the heavens and the earth are both made with this word and this anointing. Then he said that everything in it, that he formed, he will fill with this anointing. So the tree he formed, he filled it with that anointing. The plants he formed, he filled it with that anointing. He even make a comparison. There's a scripture where he says, even Solomon in all his glory was not even clothed as one of these lilies. He's bragging about his inventions. He's bragging about his character. He's saying, you see that lily, that flower right there? Y'all brag about Solomon, about how wise he is and how much he gives back to the earth. If you only knew what I put in that little lily, if you only knew what it operates and what it gives off to the earth, Solomon can't even compare to the lily. You don't even know what I clothe that thing with. So he's showing you his creation and he's showing you everything that he formed and he's showing you everything that he filled it with. And when that thing that's formed and filled begin to produce, you say, my God, look at Jesus. Look at Man. Jesus. That's the word. It looks just like him. That's why we're in awe of his creation. I'm going uh, to show you a, an example of, you know, God and his manifestation and his true glory. Um, and then I'm going to come back to this. And to do that, I'm actually going to get a fresh piece of paper. One second. One second. All right, in the meantime, come with me to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Let's go over to Luke chapter 9. All right. Jesus is intentional about everything 
Like he, he doesn't do anything by mistake. He doesn't do anything unintentionally. Everything he does is so intentionally. This is the uh, transfiguration. This is Luke chapter nine, verse 28 and 36. Luke nine, we're gonna start at verse 28. Luke 9, we're going to start at verse 28. All right, let's get into it. It says, about eight days later, Jesus took, I'm going to write these down so we can keep track of them. Jesus took Peter. Uh, he took John. And he took James. Says on the eight days later, Jesus took Peter, he took John, and he took James upon a high mountain to pray. Mm -hmm. And he was praying. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was transformed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Jesus is showing them the true manifestation of his glory. He's giving them a glimpse of, of his true identity. So his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, two of men, two men. Uh, Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. So let's see who popped up. We got Moses and Elijah. So these two pop up on the scene. And it says they were glorious to see him. And they were speaking about the exodus from this world, which was about to be fulfilled in Jerusalem. They're talking to Jesus about him leaving. They came to minister to him. Peter and others have fallen asleep. When they woke up, they saw Jesus, glory, and the two men standing with them. As Moses and Elijah were standing, I'm sorry, were starting to leave, Peter, not knowing what he's saying, blurted out, Master, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let us make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But even as he was saying this, a cloud overshadowed them, and terror gripped them as the cloud covered them. Then a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son. Beloved means the believed love. This is my beloved son, my chosen one, two words, hear him. Two words God had to say to you. This is my beloved son, mm -hmm. oh, well please, two words, hear him. When the voice finished, Jesus was there alone. They didn't tell him, uh, they didn't tell anyone at the time what they had seen. Let's look at this story real quick. You got Peter, you got John, and you got James, and he took all of them on this mountain. Now, these names represent something. When you look in your concordance or uh, your, your dictionary, you can look up the names of these people and they all their names represent something in the Hebrew or the Greek. So John name represents grace. Peter is stone or rock. And then James is surplanted or replaced. James means surplanted or replaced. Then you got two other characters in the story. You got Moses, who represents the law. And then you got Elijah, who represents the prophets. And obviously, there were other prophets. There was Eric, uh, Isaac, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, there was Jeremiah. There was Elijah. There was Isaiah. There was other prophets. And now he's representing these prophets. So Jesus took Peter, John, and James up on this exceedingly high mountain. And then he shows him their, his true glory. He turns white and his face is different. And then all of a sudden, Moses shows up and Elijah shows up. And Moses represents the law and Elijah represents the prophets. In the Old Testament, the prophets were always pointing towards Jesus. They were always talking about the coming of the Messiah. They were always talking about this man, this Christ that is coming and he is the 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 propitiation of our sins. He is the remission of our sins. That's why when John seen him, he said, behold, the Lamb of God, that's him. So he mm -hmm. represents the prophets, he represents the law, and then he got these three here with him. And then it says, 
after God said, this is my beloved son, hear him, it says they turned around and Moses was gone and Elijah was gone. And it says that all that remained standing there was Jesus. Now he took Peter, James, and John with him. Mm -hmm. And he's showing them his true glory. Here's the message he wanted you to get. Jesus is on the scene. We're not under the law, we're under grace. The law is not void, but it has been fulfilled. Amen. The prophets have been pointing to this man named Jesus this whole time, and now he's here. And so after God says, this is my beloved son, hear him, it says, then Elijah went away because we don't need the prophets pointing because he's here. And then Moses went away and we don't need him to bring the law because the law is here. And look who he took to the mountain, Peter, John, James. Listen to the message. Grace, which is John, replace, which is James, stone, which is Peter, which represents the law. So he took them on the mountain of transfiguration and he brought these three intentionally with him to give you a message that he brought grace to replace stone. What was written on that stone? The word of God, the law. He said, I brought the anointing to fulfill the law. This is yes. the anointed word. Christ is the anointed word. So I brought my grace. And then James to replace. Peter represents the law, the stone. So now the prophets disappear and the law disappears. And mm -hmm. now only thing is left is Jesus, grace and truth. Yes, yes, amen. He's full of grace and truth. He mm -hmm. said, don't look towards the law anymore. Look yes. towards Jesus. He said, don't look to the prophet no more. Look towards Jesus. Mm -hmm. Grace has replaced that. I brought back the word and the anointing. Yes. The law alone is not going to do you any good. You don't have the power to fulfill it. But I came back to release this anointing called Christ. And when that anointing gets on that word and in that blood and in that body, you have the power to perform. Amen. Grace. Amen. We are under this covenant of grace. So back to image, the essential nature, uh, the word image uh, is called teslem, T-S-E-L-E-M. It's a Hebrew word. It means the essential nature of God. His inherent nature is creation. In Christ, God created the heavens in the earth. So his, his inherent nature, that anointing that's on the inside of God is creation. I told you again, Christ is the beginning. So that means time doesn't start until Christ is on the scene because he is the beginning. Everything was created by him. You notice in our timeline, we have uh, BC for before Christ, and then we have AD after Christ. So before his arrival, and then after his death, and that's how we judge our time. We go a long time before Christ, and then we're now a long time after Christ. But what was the time when Christ was on the scene? What time was that? He was here for several years. That's not even in our time. We don't even keep track. We, we, we don't even have that on our timeline. We have before Christ, and then we have after Christ, after his death. The time that he was here, there is no timeline because he is time. Hmm. Time don't start until Christ hit the scene. So he created everything, and so you have time. And then everything paused, and he said, I'm going to insert the, the, the Christ back into the scene, and time stops. And then you insert him, and then he comes, and he does what he's here to do, and then he dies, and then time starts again. God is not in time. He can freeze time anytime he wants. He can, he can start it. He can stop it. He can move it. He can change it. As long as within his law, he can perform it. So the inherent nature of creation is what image means. Image is not this body you see. It's not what you physically see. That is reflection of image. Image is what is on the inside. He, he created man in his image. Once again, man is spirit. Mm -hmm. He created man in his image. You didn't get into the body until you became humus man, which is human. So in the beginning, he created that man, that spirit in his image. So that spirit contains his DNA. That spirit 
contains Christ, the DNA, the power and wisdom of God. Where's my chart at? I must have moved it. Oh, here we are. It's the visible image of God, the power and wisdom of God, and it's the authority, and it's the beginning. So God made us in his image and in his likeness. Likeness means to be God-like. When, the, when, the, when you read in the Bible anything that says godly, be ye therefore godly, or they refer to men as godly, godly just means godlike. So God made us in his image, reflecting his own uh, perfections, his knowledge, his righteousness, his holiness, and his dominion. He gave us power to become sons. So to show you how he created a son, I got to first show you what's in the father. Matter of fact, I could use your help on this. If you want to help me name some attributes that represent who the father is. There are many descriptors and things that we have uh, to identify and characterize who God is. And so let's put up an image of God. So let's put him right up top. We know God has several names and several descriptions, but if you don't mind, if I can get some of you to participate, can you can can some of you unmute and just throw me some characteristics of who God is? What is God? Who is he? What's what's in the inside of him? What he's like? Uh, what he exhibits? What he gives off? You know, just just get, give me some characteristics so I can know who this God is. And if you serve him, I hope you know a few things about him. Almighty. <laughs> Almighty. Yeah, that's it. Almighty. All knowing. I like that one. He's all knowing. What else is he? Omnipotent. Yeah. All power. Yes. He's loving. He's omnipresent, so he's everywhere. God is love. Woo! Who said that? Me. That was Demetrius. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you, sir. We're going to write that one big and bold. God <laughs> is love. Love got a, a million attributes within itself. Man, tip and Let me put a few more up on this board. Maybe peace. God is peace. He's a healer. Comforter. Yeah, there we go. Comforter. Merciful. Merciful. Mm. Mercy. He's a provider. He's our father. <laughs> He's a father. Amen. He's a father. Anything else comes to mind? How about he? Go ahead, mommy. He's a sustainer. I love Amen. it. He's a sustainer. He, he, he holds all of creation within himself. Everything that exists came from him. So everything that exists is in him. He holds it all together. Any other attributes you can think of? We got right. one more. He's an anchor. He's an anchor. I love it. And, you know, he's an anchor. Anybody got any others they want to add? Righteous. I'm sorry, say that again. He's forgiving. Did, did, did you say righteous? I said, I said forgiving, that. but he is righteous too. Yeah. Oh, let's look at those. Forgiving, forgiving, and righteous. Okay. We got a lot of good attributes up here. So all these things make up our God. And there's millions of more words we can come up as descriptors. Now let me show you something. He said, I'm going to make man in my image and my likeness. He created the son. The reason why Jesus is the only begotten is because he was the only one that came directly from God, essential nature. That, that lamb that was slain, that blood that was spilled, that was God himself. That was his anointing that was used for our atonement. So God said, I'm going to create a son. I'm going to let my children have dominion over this thing called earth. 
But remember that he created all of these things through the anointing of Jesus. So everything in heaven and everything in the universe and everything on earth was designed through his image. His, his, his anointing is that image. The anointing has the word in it. It's the DNA of the anointing. Mm -hmm. So to create a son of God, do you even, can you even capture how significant? I mean, that, this is God. You're going to give him a son? <laughs> do you know what has to be in the son to be a child of, to say my dad is God? Like that's an unthinkable thought. Mm -hmm. So all these things would have to be passed along in order to create a son. Amen. Listen to the definition of a son. The word, I don't even know how to pronounce the word actually. It's H-U-I-O-S. It's a, it's a Greek word, H-U-I-O-S. I don't know the pronunciation of it. Uh, it means, it says this word stresses the quality of his essence and one so resembling another mm -hmm. that distinctions between the two are indiscernible. Mm -hmm. He said the son and the father are so similar in their nature. He said the very essence of everything that's in God is being placed into this thing called the son. And they're so close in essence of nature and they resemble each other, each other so closely that trying to find a distinction between the son and the father, he said, is indiscernible. You can't even discern it. Mm -hmm. When you see the father, you see, when you see the son, you see the father. He yes. said it over, and over. I and the father are one. If you see me, you see him. What are you talking mm -hmm. about? You can't discern the difference between me and the father. Everything that's in him, that's in me. Mm -hmm. I'm so he said, I'm going to create a son. And everything you just said, almighty, all-knowing, all-power. Well, man ain't all-knowing. Man ain't all-power. He <laughs> not. Man is made in the image of Christ. Amen. That's the wisdom. That's the power. That's Amen. the authority. That's the fullness of God. God took, he created the heavens and the earth using this anointing that came from the blood of the lamb. That is Christ. That is the anointing. He took that anointing and then he began making the heavens. He began making the earth. He began creating nature, everything that resembled his character. And then he took all that anointing that's in the heavens, all that anointing that's in the earth, everything that's within the earth, everything that I created. And he said, I'm going to take all of this power, this word, this anointing, and I'm going to place it inside of a thing. And I'm going to call that thing my son. So if God has all heaven and all earth and all power in him and everything he used to create was through Christ, and then he took the fullness of all these things called Christ and put them on the inside of you. That Amen. means you are the crown of creation. Amen. That means everything in heaven and everything in the earth mm -hmm. is all wrapped up into one spirit and place on the inside of you. And he said, that's me and that's my son. Yes. That thing looks exactly like me. That thing performs exactly like me. It loves. It, it, it's peace. It's, it, it's a healer. That, that, that man is a comforter. He's a sustainer. Yes. He holds Amen. creation by the word of his power. He is mm -hmm. mercy. He's a provider. He's, un, he, he, he's, he's Jesus. Amen. Amen. He's Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen. If you can make a God, you can make a son. Mm hmm so he said, I'm going to give you power over everything pertaining to life and godliness. All heaven and all earth will come under the authority of the son. Yes. This is why you have the power over, you have the power over all elements in heaven and in earth. He said, whatever you bind on earth, it'll yes. be bound in heaven. Whatever Amen. On earth, it'll be loose in heaven. Why? Mm -hmm. Because I put the power of heaven and earth on the inside of you. I made it so that when you declare a thing, it shall be established. Because you have to operate in this anointing because the heaven and the earth was created by the anointing. Mm -hmm. You were created by the anointing. But if you think about it, if heaven and earth was made in the anointing, made from the anointing, he formed and then he filled. He formed and then he filled. There are heavenly bodies in heaven. The angels are heavenly bodies. 
but the anointing made the heavens as well. So that means even the angels. He said, aren't the angels ministering spirits? Aren't, isn't that what they are? That means they're spirits that have a body that he formed. He placed that knowledge on the inside of it, and then he's allowing that body to minister. That's the same thing he's doing with you. Amen. He formed you. He placed that knowledge inside of you, and now he wants to use that to minister. Mm -hmm. One thing you never realize is that uh, when you minister to people, that allow God to minister to you. Mm -hmm. He said it's, it's, a, it's a more significant blessing to give than it is to receive. So when, when, when you're doing his will and you're worshiping him and you're ministering to people and you're ministering love and you're ministering salvation, that is God uh, opportunity to minister to you. God, God is ministered when he can give ministry himself. So you, he wouldn't have did all this if he didn't want to have the relationship, if he didn't want to have the ministry, but he did it because he wanted that. And so when you don't go out and minister, that, that cuts off the relationship and cuts off his capacity to minister to you. Yes. God, God is love. Mm -hmm. So that's how he made a son. He took everything he made and he placed all of that image into a being and said, that is going to be my son. All right, let me scroll down. How are we doing on time? 12, 15. Okay, I'm going to go for like 15 more minutes. Uh, let's switch to, back to this real quick. Image, I told you, is on the inside. Um, in life, we go through these things where we create image. Next week, I'm going to talk at great length and have some phenomenal examples uh, what image is all about. But I'll give you a few of those examples today. So movie actors are the best description for what I'm talking about. There's nobody who gives a better example of what I'm about to explain than the idea of actors and actresses. So check this out. So in film, when you act, look at how this thing unfolds. So you have a guy who uh, we should call him content creator. And the content creator goes and write a script, right? So they write a script and they said, this script is gonna be this person and they're gonna do these things and they're gonna behave this way and they're gonna have these emotions. And the author writes a script. And then you get somebody like a Denzel Washington, they come over and they apply for that script. And what they do is they study the script, they meditate on the script, they become the image. Mm -hmm. The image, again, is on the inside. It's not the outside. It's the inside. It's a direct reflection of the nature, of the essence of that image. So the author, the content writer, makes the script. Denzel grabs the script. Denzel meditates on the script. Denzel becomes the character in the script. When mm -hmm. Denzel performs to the character in the script and you see that image, you don't know the difference between the character and the script. He's reflecting that, but that's yes. who Denzel is. Mm -hmm. He took on that character. He chose to become that character. He meditated on that knowledge. He got mm -hmm. understanding, he got wisdom, and then he had the ability to become that script. Mm -hmm. So you watch them in a movie and, and, and before you know it, your emotions are impacted based on what you see. Mm -hmm. Your feelings are impacted based on what you hear and experience. You're falling in love with a character. That's not even his, that's not his real identity. Yes. That's just who he became. And then he does it again. So he goes from training day to John Q. Mm -hmm. And then he goes on to another character. And then he goes on to another character. Then he goes on, my, my God, how many characters can you become? And, and he's, not, <laughs> he's not just pretending. Uh, the person literally becomes that character because they have to make you believe that they are that character. Yes. So they get mm -hmm. that information on the inside of them. And then they literally be become that character. And then they perform to that capability. And then we watch that character. And then we have... We, 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 we think thoughts and we have feelings based on the image that we see. There's a man um, that played the actor of the Joker, the Batman Joker. Some of you guys might already heard this story. Um, the guy 
has a whole writing that he did. You got to read this article. I'm going to try to send everybody the link. And look what happened. The guy is playing the recent movie, The Joker. He was the actor. And so he wanted to become this script. Now, if you don't know The Joker, The Joker is a deep, dark, depressed, demented character. And so this guy goes and gets the script and he, and, and he interviews and he gets the part. And so he takes the script of The Joker and he goes off into a distant land and he gets a hotel room and he locks himself in the hotel room. In the article, you gotta read what he says. His words say it all. He said, I meditated on this script over and over and over. I recited it. He said, I even started playing with voices that represented what I read. He's finding and identifying the sound that goes along with the script. So he's in his room by himself becoming the character. Listen, if you've seen Batman, you've seen the Joker, you know he's crazy, you know he's silly, you know he's demented, you know he's depressed, you know he got this chaotic, uh, psychopathic, mental thing going on, he's crazy. So the man gets the script, he becomes the character, the man killed himself. Mm. The man killed himself. His best friend said he became depressed. He became demented. He became confused. This guy has been in acting for a long time. He knows how to become a character and manage a script. But this character, his body don't know the difference. He became the character. So mm -hmm. the depression became real. So the mental became real. You can become any character see it you can become it if you believe it you can become it he became the joker and guess what he did he killed himself he killed himself the information is not pretend the spirit that god gave you is a capacity of knowledge mm. your free will is the right to to, to 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 interchange that knowledge you're not supposed to but you can you have the capacity in your free will you can change the course of knowledge you can adapt and take on a new body of knowledge if you choose to. So he took on the Joker. Now this man is walking around and he's going crazy, losing his mind in real life, and he kills himself. God said, when you disobeyed me, you gave up my essential nature. You lost the authority of Christ. You have no relationship to the world anymore. He told him, he said, the ground won't produce for you. The ground is made from the anointing. He told, uh, he, he told um, when Cain and Abel got into it, he said that the, the, the blood was crying from the ground, crying for revenge. And then when Jesus died on the cross, there's a scripture said that his blood screamed forgiveness, not the message of Abel. That blood's crying for re, uh, uh, revenge. Jesus' blood, when it leaked, when he died, when he said it's finished, that anointing went into the ground. God said that anointing is crying forgiveness. So now the ground and the earth will produce for us. Well, if the ground and everything in the earth is made from the anointing, and that anointing is inside you, now you see the relationship between who you are and everything in the earth and how the earth is supposed to respond to you. The body you live in is made from the earth. The mm -hmm. earth is made from that anointing. Your spirit is made from that anointing. Everything is made from that anointing. That is why the, the, the term is holiness. It's wholeness. It's oneness. Everything is under Christ. If you're in Christ, everything that's made from Christ will respond to Christ. It's oneness. This is why when you declare a word and you expect to see the manifestation of that word, it's only going to manifest if that word has the anointing on it. Because the earth is made from the anointing. So the earth is sitting back like, okay, as soon as the anointed word comes, we will perform it. He said, don't silence him. The rocks will cry out. The, the, the anointing has to be released. So the same way that man took on that character of the Joker is the same way God is asking us to take on the character of Christ. He said, get this anointing back on the inside of you. That way I can lead you and guide you into all truth, but you have to sanctify yourself through his word because his word is true. When you meditate in the word of God, that word is anointed. So there's an agreement that happens when that word mingles with your spirit. When it commingles with your spirit, 
there's a, 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 a truth, an acceptance of truth that happens. And then you have that oneness. So he's saying, sanctify yourself through my word. Make yourself back one with my word. And then you have the anointing again. That's why anything not of faith is sin. How about that scripture? Anything not of faith. And I love the word anything. That made room for no exceptions. That means if it doesn't come through the anointing, no. it's sin. Mm -hmm. Anything not of faith. Faith has to come through the anointing. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the rhema word of God, the anointed word of God. If that word comes through the anointing, if, if anything comes in this earth that does not come through the anointing, it is categorized as sin. If it comes into the world, it better come through the anointing because everything is created from the anointing. I don't want nothing here that ain't anointed. Now, I'm going to wait on that part. I'm going to wait on that part. So we, we, we haven't seen the impact that we expect to have because we've been releasing words that aren't anointed. When, when, when I asked Leisha a question last night, I said, babe, who are you? And you're not allowed to use your name as a response. Tell me, who are you? Really, think about that. You are man, you are spirit, you have the knowledge of God. Yeah, you've been separated, but he brought it back so that you can be back in communion. But if you take a good hard look at yourself right now, if image is on the inside, ask yourself, get a pen and paper and write down, who in the world am I? And so Alicia said, that's a, that's a really good question. She said, I'm, I'm, I'm actually having a hard time answering. I said, well, don't worry about it. Just shoot. Whatever comes to your heart and mind, just give me that. And I'm going to give you what she gave me. She said, where is it? Is that here? Oh, here it is. <laughs> All right. She said, I'm a woman. I'm a wife. I'm a daughter, I'm a family member. She said, I'm a human being. She said, I'm relational. She said, I'm a resource, I'm a doctor, I'm a friend, and I'm a pet mom. Because <laughs> she got Memphis. <laughs> so these are all the things that she's saying that she is. Jesus said, who do men say that I am? Who do they say I am? They said, some say Elijah, some say this, some say that. And they were just naming prophets. And then he said, Moses, who do you say? I'm Moses. He asked Peter, who do you say I am? He said, you're, you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God. But notice how he starts off with, you're the Christ. First words out of his mouth. You are the Christ. You are, your identity is the Christ. The same thing he used to create the heavens and the earth, that's who you are. Mm -hmm. Everything pertaining to life and godliness, that's who you are. The Prince of Peace, the Lord of Hosts, the Anointed Word, Revelation Knowledge, that's who you are. Mm -hmm. You are the Christ. He told them his title. Mm -hmm. Son of the Living God came after the title. That's what the title represents. You are the Christ. Who is the Christ? You're the Son of the Living God. Jesus, come on the scene. Jesus said the same thing God said when he was talking to Moses. He said, hey, I am. Well, who are you? I'm the way. Amen. I'm the truth. Mm -hmm. I am the life. This is called the Lamb's Book of Life. Mm -hmm. He said, I am that life. I am that Lamb. John told you, behold, the Lamb of God. I am the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. This is the Lamb Book of Life. I was slain before the foundations of the world. And now the foundations of the world were created through me. Then Jesus said, I enter into the world and the world received me not. It's created by me and it doesn't even know me. All of creation came through my blood and none of creation even knows me. You don't even recognize me. What in the world did y'all do to this place? So he said, she said, I'm a, I, I, one of the things that she have on here, I'm a doctor, that's a title. That's a title. So when you make a list of everything that you are, pay close attention to which one are characteristics, which ones are attributes, and which ones are titles. 
because for every title you have, there is a knowledge base associated with it. There's knowledge, there's understanding, there's wisdom, and then there's the ability to perform. So if Leisha says she's a doctor, I expect her to have knowledge and understanding and wisdom and ability to perform. So Leisha is at work and there's somebody that comes into her office and they pass out and their heart stops and they're going through serious complications and they're probably near death. And now everybody's looking at the doctor, do something. She better have the knowledge, the understanding, the wisdom and the ability to do something. Amen. Because that's your title. Mm -hmm. So Alicia shows up and she grabs the patient, she checks, there's no heartbeat. And then she's checking this and checking that and things aren't looking good. And so she grabs the thing and she charges, she says, charging, she puts them on and she shocks the person and the person comes back to life. She knew what to do based on the knowledge, understanding and wisdom. She had the ability that's accompanied by that title. Mm -hmm. So when people see that title, they run to the ability because they have a need that that ability can solve. Yes. He said, you are the Christ. What is the Christ? Son of the living God. You yes. say you are a child of God. You say you are a son of the most high. That means you carry that title. Yes. And if you carry the title of Christ, you are saying you have Christ within, and that's Christian. And if you are Christian, there are some people out here that are going to need your knowledge, your understanding, your wisdom, and your ability. And when they see that title, say, oh, that person is in Christ, people are going to come running. Mm -hmm. Because you are supposed to carry the wisdom yes. and power of God. Yes. And anything that has the wisdom and power of God, I'm telling you, we live in a world that needs it. Yes. So people will see that title. They will run coming to be saved. They're going to run coming for healing. They're going to come running for knowledge and revelation mm -hmm. and wisdom. They're going to come running for purpose. They're going to come running, wanting to be part of God. Mm -hmm. They see Jesus in you. But when you see an image, what is it that you think? What is it that you feel? That's what images are for. It reflects the knowledge, and then it makes people think and feel something based on that image. When people saw Peter, when people saw Paul, when people saw Timothy, when people saw these mighty men of God, the scripture said, they said, my God, these men are like gods. Mm -hmm. That's what they're supposed to say about us. Amen. We're supposed to be in Christ. We're supposed to have that anointing running through us. They're supposed to look at you and say, that person reminds me of God. The mm -hmm. things that they do, they, you got to come from God. Amen. Only God could do that. So it's challenging to carry a title when you don't got the ability associated with yes. it. Man, that's a hard burden. Listen, uh, here comes some transparency and some honesty. I used to take um, jobs that I wasn't uh, fully qualified for. I became a master at it. Um, my, my vision was always to reach as high as I can. Even when I knew I wasn't fully qualified, you're going to have to tell me no because I'm still going to aim for it. What I became very good at is I learned uh, uh, the appearance of an image. Mm -hmm. The appearance of an image. I watch CEOs. I watch Jeff Bezos. I watch Jack Welch. I watch presidents. I watch character. I watch the way they hold their hands. I watch the way they cross their legs. I watch the way they sit. I watch their body language. I watch their voice inflections. I watch their mannerisms. I watch how they dress, their shirt, their tie, their socks, their shoes. I watch the way they communicate, everything about them because I loved and I wanted to become what I saw. And so I took on the image, but I didn't have the knowledge. When I stood in front of CEOs, they couldn't tell me that I wasn't a CEO. They treated me like a CEO because I presented myself as a CEO, even when I didn't have the knowledge to accompany it. So I would get myself in the door and I would get myself into some of the biggest positions and some of the biggest titles because I had the, the physical, the outward image. But now you got to perform. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now you got to show you got the knowledge, the understanding, the wisdom, the ability. You got to show it. And I had a problem because I had the image and everybody accepted me because of the image, but then I couldn't perform to the image. Amen. So I, I, I would put myself through significant stress, go home at night and study just to go to work tomorrow and perform to that capability. And then the next day study and go perform to that capability. Why? I'm trying to maintain the image. Yes. 
And we're doing the same thing in Christ today. We're Amen. saying we're Christians. We're saying we got the anointing. We're saying we got the power. We're saying we're children of God, but we don't show the power of the image. Mm -hmm. We're not performing to the ability. The, the, the power of God is called dunamis. That is the ability to perform his word. Amen. Back in the day when you had knowledge and understanding and wisdom, you had ability. And that ability usually reflects itself in a title, which is usually a career choice or whatever. So you have a title that reflects your ability. That ability, that title is valuable. People in this world pay for value. So they see the title, they see the ability, they know when they see that title, oh, she's a doctor, she comes with all this understanding. We assign a monetary value to it. Oh, they're a doctor, we'll pay them $300,000 a year because the world needs that ability. And so there's a value and then there's money and then there's status. Oh man, everybody wants the status. Everybody wants the status. What is the status? The status is the preferred treatment. When you've got a certain ability and a certain value, people begin paying you, the world sees that, it puts you in an economic status. It puts you in a social status. And in that status, you get preferred treatment. This is why they want the money, because they want the status. They love to ride in first class. They love to stand in that line at the airport that says preferred line on it. They love the platinum status at hotels and upgrades to suites. They love going to country clubs where they can be around people <laughs> with similar status. It's beautiful. You got status. People treat you well. People give you preferential treatment. Why? Because you have status. And money was usually the indicator of status, but it's a byproduct. When you have that status, it's because you have that money. You only got that money because you have that ability that came from the knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Now look at what the corrupt world done did. The world that made a, made a way where image has replaced ability. You see, it used to be this ability came from a title and then you got the money, you got the status, and you got the image. That when people seen you, they seen influence of power and authority. Because when you seen them, you thought money, you see them, you thought this, and you seen their ability, you see this and you see that, and it's all image to create influence. But the world has done a mix up now, where as long as you got the money, it don't have to come from knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. If you got the money, we'll give you the status and the image. Mm -hmm. They done bypassed the knowledge, the understanding, and the wisdom and went right for the image. Hmm. You don't got to have the knowledge, understanding, and wisdom and ability no more. Just have the money. We'll give you the status and the image to influence everybody. Hmm. What? So I can be a complete idiot, not knowing anything I'm talking about. <laughs> but if I find my way to money, you'll give me the status and image to influence others. Hmm. I've seen this over and over and over and over again, where people are popping up with status and image and influencing millions of people with no knowledge, no understanding, no yeah. words. It, it used to be a byproduct. If you had that money, you only got it because you had the ability that go with it. Mm -hmm. and the only other way you used to get it back then if you hit the lottery. You don't gotta have the knowledge and ability and all that. You just hit the lottery and you get to join the status and the image and the influence. But now people aren't requiring you to have the ability. They're not requiring the knowledge and the wisdom anymore. They just require the image. Look at look, look at how men, and I'll throw myself at who I used to be in that category as well. Look at how men choose women nowadays. Mm -hmm. They're going for the image. Amen. They don't care about the knowledge and understanding and wisdom anymore. They don't care what's on the inside. Matter yeah. of fact, you're on social media all the time anyways. People don't even get to hear what come out of your mouth. They're not going to experience you that much, no way. Let's just focus on the image. Yes. They don't care what's on the inside. Let's focus what's on the outside. Mm -hmm. If it looks good, that's good enough for me. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we switched what this thing consisted of. And it's put us in a predicament that we're seeing a product that doesn't have the ability, it just has an outer image that looks like it has the ability. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna cover one more piece and I'm gonna, I'm gonna get us out of here. One more piece, 
on second. There we go. So we talked about the preferred treatment. And a lot of people live life trying to create an image that's going to allow them to get this preferred treatment and to have influence. So people want to have this preferred treatment because it feels good. It makes you feel uncommon, not like everybody else. It puts you in a certain economic and social status. It gives you favor amongst people that the, the, the traditional person doesn't get. And, and then you start having this. We all got this idea of the people we want to be around, right? Uh, I, I wrote down a few things. So you want to be around kind people. You don't want people that's rude uh, and definitely people that's not jealous. Um, I don't want people around me that are going to irritate me and be demanding of their own way. I definitely don't want anyone around me that's going to keep track of my wrongs and my mistakes. Uh, with all the injustice going on, I want somebody around me that celebrates true justice. I want people around me that's never going to give up on me, never lose faith in me. Uh, I hope for people that is willing to endure me through every circumstance. Basically, I want people around me that's going to show love. I can show love back to them. Everyone is happy. That's the preferred treatment that everybody's trying to create an image so that they can receive uh, a great deal of people. But in 1 Corinthians, don't this sound a lot like what I just described in preferred treatment? 1 Corinthians 13 and 4, love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. It's not boastful. It's not proud. It's not the people that are proud. It does not demand its own way. These people won't demand their own way. Love is not irritable. They won't be irritating. It keeps no record of wrong. These people are going to be showing love. They don't, they're not going to keep track of your wrongs and throw it in your face. Uh, it does not rejoice with injustice, but celebrates justice whenever truth wins. Love never gives up. You don't want people giving up on you. Love never loses faith. They're not going to lose faith in you. It's hopeful. It endures every circumstance to the end. This is love. The preferred treatment you're looking for is love. But God is love. And if you're a son, then love is already built on the inside of you. It's inherent in your nature. So God created you with love, and then you're chasing money to get a treatment that's already built in your inherent nature. You don't got to fight and, 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 and do all these things in hope of some preferred treatment that God put on the inside of you. God is love. Amen. And put it on the inside of you so that you can be a distributor to it, of it to the world. Jesus said, this cause came I into the world to give. Jesus came to give. He's not looking for the preferred treatment. He made himself a servant. He's here to give. He said one of the greatest commands is love thy neighbor like you love thyself. If everybody would just use what's on the inside of them and give, everybody would be giving love and everybody would be giving love and everybody would be receiving love and everybody would be receiving love. This is grace. This is the covenant we're under. This is the covenant of unmerited favor. You don't got to deserve it for me to distribute it to you. This is grace. Jesus, grace and truth. He's full of truth. My word is truth. So he is the word, he is truth, and he is grace. He's God, unmerited favor, gifted to mankind. All right, it's 11.40, and I think I'm going to stop there. Um, I'm, ex I'm extremely excited about next week, because next week we're going to go into um, some very pointed details of, of Christ, of this, this image, what is the image designed to do? And then I got a ton of very good uh, descriptors and examples of how we see that playing out in today's society. So it's gonna show you a lot about the image that God wants to create. It's gonna show you the image that Lucifer wanted to create. It's gonna show some of the strategy that he's using. But ultimately, we're gonna talk about the image of God, how to get back into that image and what that image is designed to do in the earth because we want 2022 to be a year of fulfillment. We want it to be a year where we're not exercising our will, but we're exercising God's will. We want it to be a year where we're not focused on our opportunities and what we want to do. But at some point, we turn our head back to Christ and say, Father, what is it that you desire for me? We've been on this earth for a long time, creating titles and gaining bodies of knowledge that fits what we desire to do because we were trained that way. 
You can be whatever you want to be. You can become whatever you want to become. Whatever you can dream, son, there's, a, there's a, a college or a school or a training or a development that will allow you to become that. And we do that. We dream our own will. We create our own visions. And then we go take a body of knowledge and we get trained, certified, educated, degree, and become that character. And we carry that title and we say, okay, now this is who I am. I am a doctor. I am an engineer. I am a lawyer. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. <laughs> if you are a Christian, then you are Christ-like. You are like Jesus. That means you are the way, the truth, and the life. The other scripture says, those who have not the son have not life. Amen. If you don't have the son, you don't have the life associated with the son. He is life. He said, I am life. So I come to give you life and life more abundantly. Yes. So if we want to live, it says the spirit alone bring forth eternal life. If we want to get into the life of Christ, if we want to please God and do his will, it's going to take us going back into the meditation of his word, back into the roots of where we were created from, back to our initial purpose to be in Christ. When you come back to stage one, it gets a little rugged, it gets a little rough. You ever seen somebody who got like in a car accident or maybe shot or in some type of uh, circumstance that was unpleasant and it resulted in them losing a function? Maybe they can't walk anymore. Maybe they can't talk anymore. And then they have to relearn that function. Amen. And so God is asking you to do that. He's saying, I need you to pay attention to every little detail. When you were a kid, for you to walk, you had to take one step at a time and you paid close attention to every step and every single step you had to watch where you put your foot, how much pressure, when do you pick your next leg up? Because it was new to you. You were being born into the, this character that you had to learn. Mm -hmm. So the same way you had to do that, he's saying, get back in this word, carefully study it step by step. And there's a scripture that says you'll need all three of these, faith, hope, and love. And if you get in my word and study faith, hope, and love, yes. and pay attention to the details and step by step, let me walk you through this. Let me guide you through this. Let me lead you into where I want you to go, into all understanding and truth. If you take, if you get a pen and paper and you take your non-dominant hand, I'm right-handed, this is my left hand. If you take your non-dominant hand and write a sentence. I don't care what sentence you write. You write, I love donuts. But write a sentence with your non-dominant hand. Watch the level of detail and focus that you have to have to write with your non-dominant hand. Unless you've always been doing that, it's trained. If it's not trained, do it. Get a pen and paper, just write one sentence with your non-dominant hand. You are gonna have to focus like nobody's business. I did it last night, it came out a mess. It looked like a three-year-old wrote it. It's because that hand isn't trained. Right. So it takes, it takes meditation in every little letter. You got it in your mind. You got to imagine the letter and write it just so carefully. And it still looks sloppy, but you can get through it if you, if you meditate on it and think it through. God wants you to take those baby steps with his word. He said, come back with your non-dominating mind because I want it to dominate and focus on this word step by step to the point where Christ infills you. Again, he forms and then he fills. He's trying to refill you so he can use you for his purposes. I'm going to stop us there because uh, I can go on this topic for days. I, I, I just love the topic of Christ. Uh, and next week, I'm just very excited about getting into this, to this word again because it's going to have a lot of great examples of the image and who we're supposed to be in Christ. I'll stop now for any questions, comments, feedback, thoughts. Uh, or is hello, your... this is this is Mike. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Hey, uh, I I just wanted to say that this time sure does fly by. Um, <laughs> man, I just you just leave me just wanting to hear hear more. Um, and I just I appreciate you, bro. I appreciate uh, thank you for you. that. Thank you for that, Mike. I appreciate your feedback. Thank you. Thank you. You preach today, Mars, as always, brother. Uh, thank you, Demetrius. Appreciate that, man. You know, when you was talking about that, uh, the guy, the uh, guy that, that studied the role of Joker, of the Joker, 
Mm -hmm. and, um, he um, got so in depth with that character where he became that. The Bible teaches us that by beholding, we become changed. There it is. There you it is. I mean? You behold something long enough, you're going to become that. That's so, right. That's my that's my goal for this, you know, for each day, for today. I'm not gonna say for the year, for uh, today, you know, to uh, get in in the face of Christ, just get in his presence. And that's just it. Do it. if it's just 30 minutes, you know, just start off small. A lot of times we try to overdo it and it is, you know, when we try to overdo it or put too much on our plate, we end up not doing anything. But just uh just starting off if it's just 15 minutes. I know, like I said, that's just for me. But uh, I definitely appreciate, you know, your ministry, man, and you teaching it and showing us, you know, leading us in this truth. So, Absolutely. Thank you for that. Absolutely. I appreciate y'all being here. Anyone else before we close? Amen. Well, I thank you for the word today. It's been a pleasure and it has certainly provoked my spirit. And um, I do appreciate you putting emphasis on loving yourself mm -hmm. because without, the Bible says to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And if you That's don't right. have a relationship with yourself and a love relationship with yourself, then you can't love other people properly. Mm -hmm. That's right. So it's got to come from, got to come from you first. Like you said, you got to become walking in the image of Christ, taking mm -hmm. on that image, taking on his nature. And as you take on his nature, then you begin to love yourself more and feel good about you. And then you can feel good about others. That's right. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Amen, mm -hmm, sis. I enjoyed yep. the lesson, Morris. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> yes, Thank you. Amen. Um, that scripture, so in case anybody wanted to know where it came from, it was 1 Corinthians 13, 13, where he said, uh, three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I haven't, I, I have not studied love. I've, I've glimpsed over it. I've gone through definitions, but I haven't done a deep dive in love, but that's definitely coming because for God to say, we know how big faith is. Everything comes by faith, the scripture says. So if he says three things last forever, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest, he put love even above faith. Mm -hmm. The greatest is love. And what I realized in that is that love is the distribution. It, it, it's the character. It's the, it's the culture in, in the way you distribute something. So you can, you, can, you can have all the faith in the world and you can have all the hope in the world, but if you don't have love, you have nothing because you don't have the heart to distribute it correctly. You ever let somebody borrow $30 or ask them somebody to borrow some money and the manner in which they gave it to you didn't even want it? Mm -hmm. You'd rather be in lack than to receive it in that manner. So love is saying, hey, I'm going to give you everything pertaining to life and godliness through faith and hope. But man, if you don't know how to distribute it through love, then I don't want you to be a distributor. I mean, so, I, need that. I need that. I don't care how they give it to me. <laughs> 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 you want the $30 regardless? <laughs> thank, thank, you, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I understand that. I wouldn't want it like that. <laughs> yeah, I, so 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 god god is just showing us that there's a strong focus and intentionality on how he wants things distributed that comes from him because when it comes from him he wants it to resemble and reflect his very nature uh, that's why he said he loves a cheerful giver because he said, don't give nothing to me if you can't do it in cheer. Because if it ain't in cheer, God said he don't want it. He Amen. wants a cheerful giver. So I, I will close on that note. I just want to say thank you all for, for coming on. Um, please be here next week. I, I'm just beyond excited to show you what the Spirit placed in my heart to give you for next week. Um, and feel free to reach out throughout the week. If, if you end up with questions or, or have information to give, you know, I'm a teacher, but I'm always a student. I'm always a student. 
So I would love if sometime if the message hits you in a certain way, if you got questions or you got feedback, please call me throughout the week. I don't care what time it is. Just pick up the phone and call me and say, hey, I was thinking about this. And I remember you said that. And, you know, I, that it feeds my spirit to hear people call and tell me what they got or what they can give me because I'm, I'm an open vessel for it. So thank you for coming. And uh, I look forward to seeing you next week. And I'll just close this in a quick word of prayer. Uh, Father God, we, we thank you for this time and this opportunity to come before your throne of grace. We thank you for the opportunity and your unmerited favor uh, to become, you said you gave us the power to become sons. Mm -hmm. And so Father, that's what we desire. We desire to become who you made us to be. You know, we, we, we fell away from your grace, Lord, and, and you gave us your son as the remission of sins. And we love you and we thank you for that. We, we appreciate your sacrifice. And we won't let that blood be spilled in vain. Amen. We will take that authority. We will take that power. We will become back into the very image in which you placed us in. And Father, we just want to, we want to expand your kingdom on this earth. You said, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth, just like it is in heaven. And I know they give you glory in heaven. I know they give you worship in heaven. So, Father, we desire to, to let your glory shine through us. We desire to worship you in spirit and in truth. We will yes. sing our praises to you because you are a good God and your mercy yes. endures forever. We thank you for your forgiveness of sin. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for time and time again. You've never left us and you've never forsaken us, Father. Yes, Lord. We can depend on you yes. if we can't depend on anybody else. Yes. So we turn our hearts towards you. We turn our minds towards you. We say greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Yes, Lord. We will not have fear of what we face in the world because you are our rock. We will turn our eyes towards you. You are the author and finisher of our faith. Our righteousness is of faith. And we thank you, Father. Thank you. We will believe in your word. We will sanctify ourselves through your word. And we yeah. will become children of the most high again. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you all. Pleasure seeing your faces again. And I'll see you again next week. I'm ready. All right. All Love right. everyone. Happy New, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you, Morris. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year.